Critical mass is one of those terms that became very popular in common language, but unfortunately is widely used incorrectly. In simple terms, it refers to the minimum amount of material, like uranium or plutonium, so that a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction can occur. Here comes important detail. The conditions for a chain reaction can depend on many other variables. A more appropriate term is criticality, which refers to a set of conditions. The mass needed for criticality is just one component, whereas criticality can occur even when the mass is low under the right conditions. In fact, the conditions can be set in such a way that a subcritical mass can still be used for example for a bomb, like the implosion design used at the Trinity test. If you're watching this video, I suspect that you know most of the history about the discovery and description of nuclear fission. But just in case, here is a quick summary. In 1938, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann were puzzled. They bombarded uranium with neutrons and obtained barium, an element way too far in the periodic table to make sense of this result. In December of 1938, Liz Meitner and her nephew Otto Frisch decipher the mystery by realizing that the neutron split the uranium nucleus. Their calculations showed that this nuclear reaction released a hundred million times more energy than a chemical reaction. Inspired by biology, they named the process nuclear fission. Laboratories around the world reproduced and confirmed the Hannes Strassmann experiment. The new source of large amounts of energy had an obvious military application, nuclear bombs. During 1939, Niels Bohr was able to fully describe the physics of nuclear fission when he discovered that the tiny amount of uranium-235 was responsible for the process instead of the abundant uranium-238. And with Bohr, we find in 1939 what could be called the first crude estimate of a critical mass. Natural uranium contains almost 99.3% of uranium-238 and around 0.7% of uranium-235. This is how natural uranium looks. Only one in every 140 nuclei is uranium-235. Both materials have the same number of electrons, which makes them impossible to separate via chemical methods. The only minuscule difference is their mass, because uranium-238 has three more neutrons than uranium-235. Any endeavor to attempt the separation of these two isotopes in large amounts would require a massive industrial complex and a lot of resources, or as Bohr put it, you would have to turn a whole country into a factory. In other words, it cannot be done. In the early summer of 1939, French physicist Francis Perrin published a paper estimating the necessary mass of uranium oxide for a chain reaction, assuming no separation of uranium-235. He correctly used diffusion theory and found that achieving a fast neutron chain reaction in natural uranium oxide would require 40 metric tons, or 40,000 kilograms, making it impractical for a bomb and confirming Bohr's hopes. Bohr's complacency even led him to publish all the details of his analysis in the open literature. Confident that a nuclear bomb was not possible or purely impractical, his article with John Wheeler appeared in the Physical Review on the 1st of September, 1939. Coincidentally, the same day Hitler invaded Poland. The world was now at war. Critical mass can be written in terms of the density rho of the material and its volume. The simplest geometry is a sphere, so the critical mass can be written as a function of the critical radius Rc. With this parametrization, we have simplified the problem to finding the size Rc that completely defines the criticality condition. In other words, all we need now is to find the correct length scale that characterizes criticality. 
In popular nuclear physics, there are names that take most of the credit for discoveries. Robert Oppenheimer, Niels Bohr, Richard Feynman, and even Einstein. However, many other heroes of physics deserve their recognition. Lise Meitner, Enrico Fermi, Leona Woods, Hans Bethe. The story of the nuclear critical mass has a key unsung hero, Rudolf Peierls. Many authors even call him the true father of the atomic bomb because his calculations really turn a piece of uranium metal described by abstract equations into a realistic explosive material. Pyarls is one of those theoretical physicists that made numerous discoveries and has so many things after him that it's hard to describe his main contribution. Most of his work was the successful application of quantum mechanics to electrons in metals. He was trained by some of the greatest physicists of his time. He had not one PhD advisor, or Dr. Vater as they call it in Germany, but three. Arnold Sommerfeld and two of his most influential students, Werner Heisenberg and Wolfgang Pauli. Pyrrhus was so talented that after receiving his doctorate, Pauli asked him to be his assistant in Zurich. And if you need to know anything about Pauli, is that almost no one could impress him. Fun fact, Pyrrhus is also my academic great-grandfather. Useless and irrelevant information, but I find it amusing. I could talk about Pyrrhus for hours, but let's go back to critical mass. Born and educated in Germany, Pyrrhus moved to Britain when Hitler came to power. In the summer of 1939, he was a professor at the University of Birmingham when he wrote a brief article titled Critical Conditions in Neutron Multiplication, setting the basis for the complete calculation of a critical mass by improving and generalizing the result by pairing. Pyers described the distribution of neutrons produced inside a material undergoing nuclear fission using the neutron diffusion equation. This is a complicated differential equation whose solution would require its own video. Let me know in the comments if you nuclear nerds would like to see that. It is a really fun exercise, but it requires some calculus. Leaving the complicated mathematics aside, we can understand this equation in the following way. Neutrons can rapidly multiply, move inside the material producing more fission, but also escaping at the surface of the material. N represents the number density of neutrons in a small volume inside the lump of uranium. The left-hand side describes how this number density of neutrons changes with time. On the right-hand side, the first term represents the production of new neutrons by each fission reaction, while the second term is the rate at which neutrons move in and out of this small volume. Pyrrhus defined the critical condition as the state when the neutrons escaping the material are exactly compensated by the neutrons generated by nuclear fission. For what comes next, I need to introduce two crucial physical quantities that appear in most calculations and will likely appear in future videos. The first one is a cross-section, denoted by the Greek letter sigma. It can be understood as the probability that a reaction will take place. As an analogy, imagine that you're playing basketball. The bigger the area of the rim, the more likely it is that you will score. Similarly, the cross-section has units of area, a very small but measurable area. There is a cross-section for each type of reaction. In particular, we're interested here in fission cross-section which quantifies the probability of a neutron splitting the uranium nucleus. The second important quantity is called mean free path, denoted by the Greek letter lambda. It can be interpreted as the average distance a neutron will travel before hitting a uranium nucleus. This mean free path can be calculated as the inverse of the cross-section and the uranium number density. Just like the cross-section, there is a mean free path for each reaction. Here we're interested in nuclear fission. Note that the smaller the fission mean free path, the more likely it is that the neutron will split the uranium nucleus, which is produced by a large fission cross-section and a high uranium density. Interestingly, 
Pyers developed the theory behind the critical mass but did not plug any numbers to it. He was worried that with the imminent war, this was a delicate topic for a German applying for British citizenship to investigate. Otto Fritsch, Lise Meinert's nephew, who was then working with Bohr in Copenhagen, moved to Birmingham in the summer of 1939 and encouraged Pyers to publish his paper. After all, Bohr had convinced everyone that the bomb was not possible. Pyers' paper was published in June. A few months after the publication, however, Frisch has a novel thought. In the words of Pyers, one day in early 1940, Frisch said to me, Suppose somebody gave you a quantity of pure uranium-235. What would happen? They realized that despite the monumental difficulty of separating uranium-235 from natural uranium, nobody had calculated the critical mass of pure uranium-235. The way they saw it, isotope separation was really hard. But now, in the middle of a war, if a nuclear bomb was possible, somebody would definitely do it no matter the cost. They work out the consequences and use the results from Pyle's paper. From the solution of the diffusion equation, they found that the critical radius for uranium-235 is approximately 0.8 times the fission mean-free path. Plugging these definitions, we find that the critical radius can be written as 0.8 divided by the fission cross-section and uranium number density. Relating the number density to the mass density using Avogadro's number, we finally get the critical radius to be 0.8 times the molar mass of uranium-235 divided by the fission cross-section times the uranium density times Avogadro's number. This table on the right shows the list of values that they use in their calculation. Finally, plugging all these numbers, they found the critical radius to be 2.1 centimeters. This is the size of a golf ball. From the radius they could compute the critical mass, which they found to be less than 600 grams. This result had a clear conclusion. If you could get a single kilogram of pure uranium-235, a nuclear bomb was possible. Frisch and Pyers were alarmed. Their reasoning and calculation felt so trivial that it was just a matter of time before someone in Germany would get to the same conclusion. Most of the calculations of Fritsch and Pyers were correct. However, they use very crude values available in 1940. Using modern values, we find that uranium-235 has a critical radius of 8.4 centimeters, closer to a soccer ball than a golf ball. The critical mass becomes almost 46 kilograms. Similarly, for plutonium-239, one finds a critical radius of 6.3 centimeters, about the size of a cantaloupe, with a critical mass around 17 kilograms. What we found here is called the bare critical mass, because as I mentioned at the beginning, the conditions can be set for a subcritical mass to reach criticality with the help of neutron reflectors, or compression, but these are topic for another video. The Frisch Pyers result showed for the first time that nuclear bombs were no longer science fiction but a real possibility, and they would no doubt play a role in the ongoing war. Frisch was German, Pyers had just received his British citizenship, they were considered enemy aliens. Now they needed to find a way to communicate their alarming findings to the authorities. This resulted in one of the most influential documents in the history of physics and led to the development of the first nuclear bomb.